Okay, welcome to AP European History with Dr. Grofkin. Today we continue uh, our study of absolutist rulers or the rise of absolutist rulers in Europe. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Ivan the Awesome, uh, wrongly translated as Ivan the Terrible, and today uh, the topic will be about Louis XIV. Uh, this is a huge topic. He was uh, uh, one of the longest reigning monarchs from uh, 1640s to 1715. So it's a huge topic and lots of things happened, but overall uh, this was uh, the beginning of a new age for France. This was the beginning of the absolutist monarchy, the Sun King. This is the king that when we hear his name, the first thing that comes to mind is a, 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 a formula that he has invented, l'état c'est moi, uh, the state is me. So, which really in, encapsulates the idea of absolutist monarchy. The government is the king, whatever the king wants. It's divine right kings. It's a whole theory of divine right kings, which was not really used that much before that. Uh, that's him. But let's go back uh, to the very beginning uh, and what actually happened uh, when he becomes king in the uh, uh, in 1843, I believe. He's a child, and obviously there's a regency. Uh, his uh, mother the Queen, uh, and then uh, after the death of uh, Cardinal Richelieu, as we mentioned, uh, the new government is Cardinal Mazarin. Uh, so this is the context uh, that is uh, the government of France is uh, in the hands of a cardinal and uh, a woman, which is perceived as weakness. Uh, the child is, is uh, a king, and, and so there begins to be forming an opposition, which uh, is known in history as the Fronde. So uh, let's examine a little closer what exactly is Fronde. Uh, in simple terms, when you hear the, in, a, in a short history of France, what is Fronde? Fronde is defined as a kind of an aristocratic opposition to the king. Uh, which is crushed fairly quickly in a few years. But in fact, if you look at it more attentively, it's much more complex and much more ominous because, as I will show you today, the same issues will come up on the eve of the French Revolution uh, in, in 1788, 1787. So it, from that point of view, Fronde is extremely important because we will see how the, uh, the actors in the political drama act in France act out. So who are the actors in this drama? Let's put it this way. It's the king. And in this case, he's weak, just like Louis XVI was weak. Uh, you have the government, which is led by very intelligent people, uh, uh, both at, uh, at the eve of the French Revolution, but at this time, uh, Cardinal Mazarin. And then you have the grandees. You have a, a, a sort of a, uh, aristocratic opposition, the landlords, the huge independent landlords, dukes and others. Some of them are royal blood. Uh, uh, the cousin, I mean, the, the, the um, um, uncle of the king. So th this is a political force. And then you have perhaps the most important political force that is always underlooked, uh, underestimated in France, is the Parlement. So what are the Parlement? It should not be confused with the English Parliament. Parlement are not anything like the English Parliament. Because English Parliament is actually uh, a, a, a law, it's, at that time it's a consulting institution that is engaged with laws. Uh, and it does have a House of Commons. Uh, it's not only the, the landlords, although in the majority they are. But they actually feel at that time, as we shall see in the uh, Petition of Right, that they have a, a, a right to uh, compose laws and even without the key. Parlement in France are not a parliament. They are basically courts, but they are courts of, of the nobles. And the people who are there are nobles uh, and, and the big ones. So in a sense, the Parlement are the voice of the big nobles. But they're not only that, because they also uh, verify the compatibility of the king's orders to that of the, quote, ancient privileges and laws. So they're kind of a watchdog over the existing laws. And whenever a king wants to change the law, the Parlement could say, hey, wait a second, 
That's not what we're, our ancient privileges are all about. So, from a Marxist point of view, you could say that the Parlema are an instrument of the uh, feudal lords to guard their privileges. The instrument of feudal lords to defend their class interests of the big landlords. And in that point of view, they are anti-royal. They are against the king. But they're against the king not in terms of democratic freedoms and the republic as it would be later in the 18th century. No, they actually want to limit the power of the king in order to promote and defend the feudal privileges of the Grand Dukes. So that's the part, uh, thing. Also what's so amazing about them, uh, and that makes them similar to the English parliament, is that they are politically engaged. They actually agitate the masses. Uh, and in that point of view, they're similar to Catholic League of the previous century, which also manipulated the masses against the king. So, uh, the Fronde of uh, uh, 1648 is actually called the Fronde of le Parlement. So, what they actually do, they incite the masses of Paris to rebel. And there is a kind of a revolution, if you want, or uh, at least for a moment, uh, looks very similar to 1789. The, the government, the, the people of Paris basically built up Paris barricades uh, together with the Parlement of Paris, which is in the hands of the Grand Dukes, and they chase out the king, and they chase out Mazarin. Uh, now, Mazarin tries to arrest these leaders for rebellion, and he does put them in arrest. And then there is a rebellion of the masses, and then they chase out the king, so he flees uh, to uh, outside of Paris somewhere. And then Mazarin tries to come back with a, with, a, with a foreign troops, and he does, he reestablishes the order. Uh, but still, this is the kind of experience that Louis XIV would never forget. Uh, he would actually do everything in his power uh, to crush the power of the Grand Dukes, and he never liked being in Paris. This also explains why later on he would actually build a palace for himself called Versailles outside of Paris. So, again, let's look at the, uh, in, in Marxist terms, the constellation of political forces. You have the feudal lords uh, that are led partly by royal blood and the most powerful, most uh, uh, famous uh, names, uh, Duke this and that. Uh, they have their private armies, exactly as in the previous century, but these private armies are no longer religious armies. That's the difference. So exactly as a century before, uh, you had Catholic armies and Protestant armies. Now you actually do have private armies that are fighting the king. So from that point of view, uh, front the number two, which is called aristocratic front, which is uh, in the years of 1652-53, uh, this is a civil war in France between the Grand Dukes, uh, who have their private armies and support of the Spanish, so th this is a foreign help, uh, and the royal armies. The royal armies win uh, partly because the French peasants uh, don't like the Spanish intervention. They, the Grand Dukes are perceived as being traitors uh, who basically are on the side of the foreigners and that basically is why after several battles uh, the royal side prevails and Fronda is crushed. Uh, the, uh, the whole rebellion, both the parliamentary one and the Grand Dukes one, is all about taxes. And so this brings, for the first time, there's a new term that will be so important in the history of France and then in the history of uh, Europe. Uh, the term is bourgeoisie. Uh, that would be one of the crucial terms that Marx would use, but of course Marx used it because it already existed. Who are the bourgeoisie? The bourgeoisie are people who live in Bourg, and Bourg is a city, so that means townspeople. And who are the townspeople? Well, the townspeople are the artisans, the lawyers, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, people who have small businesses, and people who are not nobles. So they're common people. In the French Revolution, they would be known as the third estate uh, in terms of their social status in French society. So the bourgeoisie, they are the ones who have to pay the taxes. And they are the ones who have to carry the burden of the royal debt incurred during the Thirty Years' War uh, uh, that ended in 1648. 
So here is again a situation very similar to the 1789. You have uh, you have uh, France suffering from the debt of the war. The king raises the taxes. The bourgeoisie doesn't like it, uh, and then they gang up with the masses of Paris and they chase out the king. I mean, the scenario is almost identical to what's going to happen in 1789. But at this time, uh, the king was stronger uh, and the royal army chased out uh, the uh, Grand Dukes and crushed the Parlement. However, my main point is the Parlement would remain a powerful force in French politics uh, up until the uh, French Revolution of 1789. So because of this uh, uh, front, because of this uh, conspiracy uh, of the Grand Dukes and unreliability of the masses of Paris who are ready to rebel uh, at any time, uh, Louis XIV, when he grows up, 10 years later, he becomes a young boy, I mean a young king, he has a solution. So let's look at what his solution is. His solution is number one, like of all kings, uh, what to do, his problem, what to do about the Grand Dukes and the aristocracy, number one. The problem, how to raise money for wars, and he wants to do a lot of wars and he will. That's number two. Uh, and then uh, what your policies would be to other classes, such as to the bourgeoisie, the peasants, and the most important in France, what to do about the Huguenots, who have been crushed by Richelieu, but they're still there. <coughs> Louis XIV will find answers to all of these questions. Some of them would be very good for France. Some of them would be ruinous for France. So let us now examine what his solutions would be. Well, the number one solution is l'état c'est moi. He is going to try to create a new political system which would be called absolutist monarchy. Uh, he would become, pretty much he would try to become what Ivan the Awesome uh, the terrible uh, it has done, which means to concentrate all power in the hands of the king. So that is what he's going to do. Now, the official story of France is that he succeeded in this, that he actually has created the system l'état c'est moi. Uh, my personal view is that he did not. Uh, when we studied exactly the power of the Parlement, that remained, they continued to criticize the king, and actually the revolution of 70, 1789 did occur, as we shall see, under the direct incitement of the Parlement, uh, that acted pretty much in defense of a uh, tax-free status of the uh, grand nobility. Uh, nevertheless, he did try, and he did concentrate power, and much more power than any of the previous kings have had. So from that point of view, he did establish a centralized authority of the king. Uh, now, the next problem is what to do about nobility. Uh, Louis also had his solution, uh, which is that he expelled those that compromised themselves with the uh, aid to the to working with the Spanish as traitors, uh, but he uh, basically uh, created a new type of service. Uh, that is to, to be the loyal servant of the king. So this is his solution. He builds a, a beautiful palace in Versailles, the, the, the biggest palace that had ever been built in Europe. Uh, and he basically invites those that are loyal to come there and serve him. Uh, so this is creating a new pattern of a relationship uh, that will be mimicked and imitated all over Europe. Uh, from the time of Louis XIV, every European monarch would want to build uh, a palace that would outshine uh, that of Versailles, and uh, we shall see uh, two of those in St. Petersburg that rival uh, Versailles. Uh, and every one of them uh, would be Sans Souci uh, by Frederick the Great in, in Berlin, and, and there would be several others. So basically, he created a new pattern that everybody would try to imitate, which is uh, a huge palace, and the nobles are there. They can be watched, they could be controlled, they have jobs that they're paid for, sometimes meaningful jobs, sometimes absolutely ridiculous jobs, such as carrying the slippers to the king in the morning. Uh, but my uh, definition of this is like this. Uh, Louis XIV bribed 
than the ability to be loyal. He didn't destroy them that Ivan IV did. Uh, he bribed them. He crushed those that, that would go to war, but he would bribe others. And so how he would bribe them is basically the same method as Ivan IV, uh, basic, uh, basically by giving them rents. And in a sense, you have already two types of nobility that would be very important by the time of the French Revolution. You have the nobility of the sword, which is traditional aristocracy going back for centuries, and you have nobility of the robe, uh, which means nobility that rises through the service to the king. Uh, they get all kinds of jobs and appointments, and they become commanders in the army, they become governors, they become administrators, and basically this is uh, what they do uh, to um, uh, promote his idea, l'état c'est moi. And uh, yes, subscribe to AP European History with Dr. Brovkin and we'll take a pause. We will continue on the reign of uh, Louis XIV.